this neighborhood, neighbor. I am the Martian ambassador. Des Moines and all of central Iowa, welcome to Max World Live. Max World is your world. Every day we talk about the issues and topics that matter most to you. And as always, it's your voice we want to hear in Max World. So join the conversation by calling 515-244-0077. And now, here's the host of Max World Live, J. Michael McCoy. All right, seven minutes after the hour, 4 o'clock, 27th day of January, we will not... Well, the first part of this show will be time sensitive because we're going to talk about a current event or a couple of current events. But uh, later on, it'll be timeless because uh, Living Faith lead pastor, only pastor, Luke Tim is in the house. And I was telling him the other day that the book of Revelation is a book that scares me. Not because of what it says. I just don't understand it. I'm, I'm, I'm not mature enough. I'm not smart enough. I don't know what I am. <laughs> The, the, the knife's, uh, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, as I like to say. So Luke said that he could explain it to me like I was a six-year-old, and boy, that's my magic number. So he's going to be in to talk about that in a little bit. Also, Chris Roloff joins us along with Frank the Verse Thomas and uh, Bob Monster at the Cat in the Hat, who is monitoring the chat and the new Service Legends Truth text line at 809 809- 0993. If there's a question you'd like to ask Pastor Tim, you may do that. You may just simply text it in at 809-0993. Ryan is producing. He will be there to answer your phone calls if you should want to call in at 244-0077. Luke, welcome. Thank you very much. Good to be here. And uh, I'd just like to go on record as saying I explain everything to you like you're a six-year-old. That's kind of how our relationship works. Yeah, it works good. I I appreciate it. You bring me a lollipop (laughs) and I'll sit and listen till the center's all gone. Nice. Now, Chris, you before we get to Revelation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I have a couple of the current events I want to talk about. But you, uh, Luke, being a self-proclaimed gun enthusiast. <laughs> sure, sure. Gun nut. Gun nut. Gun nut. Wing nut. Uh, you have a question <laughs> about what's going on in Oregon. Well, the reason why I was excited when uh, I heard you were coming in and then we had the news about um, someone involved in this Occupy thing going on in Oregon was shot and killed. I know that was back in the news and a lot of people are interested in it. And I'm going to be honest with you, Luke. The reason what I want to know is... <laughs> they explain this to me like I'm a six-year-old. Sure, sure. I actually don't really even understand why they're camped out where they're camped out. I, I don't even understand what they're upset about. So can you can you give me the, the nickel answer of why are they upset? By the head. By the way, eight protesters have been arrested and one was killed in a okay. shootout. So, so there's a lot of people. There are a lot of people at this site now. It's not like yeah. just a couple of folks. And we've lost a life. I mean, now right. a life has been lost. Right. The uh, so the I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about it in general, and then okay. this this is a specific sort of like the the zit comes to a head and it's getting popped, right? <laughs> yes. But like in general, um, some dude named Roosevelt, maybe you heard of him, uh, back in 190 something or other, decided to um, section off huge chunks of land um, and and keep them as natural reserves for all of the country. Sure. Great federal program, and and I think most people at the time are going, oh, that's a great idea. Um, now here's the thing: all of that land sits there and is available. It's got so much resource on it that um, people said, "Well, you, can we hunt on it? Can I can I g- mine for gold on it? Can I do this?" And the answer is, "Yeah, you, just, you get get a permit and get a license, and it's this awesome thing. We all own this property, and you know they don't want you just wandering on dig a hole and go gold mining, right? They want sure. you to get a lease and all that kind of stuff. So that's what's been happening for a long time." The, the camp that the Hammond brothers and, and, and those guys are all in uh, all think that the federal government is now overreaching. Let me give you a specific example with like the Hammonds, for okay. instance. Um, there, there's this basin area, awesome, cool area for ranchers to, to have a ranch, raise cattle, and all that kind of stuff. And it sits right next to some federal property that was part of this land grant. I think it was 1908 or something like that, where they scooped up all this land and made it federal. Well, um, for for the Hammonds, they can graze on their property, um, but as their cattle gets, as their herd gets bigger, they need more land to graze. Instead of buying property, they can just lease some of this land, and their animals go on and eat the grass. This is the federal land that they're federal leasing. Land. Yeah. yeah, everybody's a winner, right? So the federal government's like, sweet, you're just giving us money so your cows can eat stuff. And they're like, yeah, and it's cheaper than buying land. Now, what happened, um, that dates all the way back 
gosh, I think the Hammond family goes back to the 40s or 50s or something like that. What started to happen was all of these ranchers, um, the, the federal government started buying up land all around them and making it part of that reserve. National Park System? Uh, it's similar to the National Park System. Um, this is a reserve. There are some differences between um, national parks and, and federal reserve land, but close enough for, for government work, right? So um, the uh, <laughs> what they were doing then is, is trying to pressure these families into selling their property. Um, the government, federal wildlife, uh, it's a federal wild waterfowl and fi- fish and waterfowl. I think that's who it was. Yeah, and then the Don't bureau. Of, me. Yeah, and then the bureau of land management are, are the specific. It doesn't have cable TV. I'm not interested. <laughs> right. Or FM radio. That's right. So they right. want the land. So um, they pressure the Hammonds to sell. They say no. Uh, pressure some other people to sell. They say no. And they go, okay, you can't graze on the property anymore. They just stop doing the lease and um, buying up different lands around them, trying to just squeeze them out. So. Their beef, the, the Hammond's beef, and, and other people's beef, it's cattle, get it? Yes. Ah. <laughs> Their beef, see what I did there? Is that um, the federal government is just being pushy and, and, and mean-spirited about stuff to try and get them to sell their property, get their land. And it, is, it had worked for years and years and years, um, but now for... And I'm going to stay out of the politics of the specific... There's conspiracy theories. Why does the federal government want this land? Why are they going to do it? Blah, blah, blah. The, the bottom line is, clearly, the federal government's trying to squeeze people, trying to get their land in any way possible. Um, some shady stuff happened. Uh, the Hammonds set some fires. Uh, they say they did it legally. The government said they did it illegally. Legally meaning they were setting uh, intentional brush fires to clear some area, that kind of stuff, yeah. as opposed to being arsonists? Right. What they said is, they called in and said, we are we are planning a, a scheduled burn on our private property, and then it got out of control and went over to the, the um, federal property. Um, the government says... Ah, so, so getting on the federal property then was, their claim, an accident. Yes. And okay. it's a no-no. Um, you shouldn't start things that belong to the federal government on fire. Yeah, they don't. I wouldn't, I wouldn't like that if I someone mean, set my stuff on fire. Right. And, yeah. and, but you don't have tanks. Yeah, that's just, <laughs> not <did>. yet. <laughs> not yet. Day's coming. That's right. Um, so so they, go, they go to jail for that uh, eventually. Okay. It, it took uh, years and years and years, and finally they end up in jail. Uh, and the the uh, judge, uh, that judge retired or the, their last day was that day and said, um, I'm sentencing this guy to, to three months, that guy to 12 months. I think the dad got uh, 12 months and the son got three months or something like that. Um, and then it was set aside, f- kind of finished in a sense. The Hammonds had to sell their property, end up buying it back when the guy died. All of that, blah, 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 blah. Fast forward then to, this all happened in 2001, they went to jail. 2012, the government um, goes, you know, there is this federal minimum for terroristic acts of five years in prison. And starting those fires on the, the federal property was a, an act of terrorism. You're terrorists. And you have to come back to jail uh, for the to to finish out your five years. Is that even legal? To ma- isn't that double jeopardy or something? That's mm-hmm. retroactively... Uh, retroactively going back and trying to extract a pint of blood. Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna say uh, there's a lot of things I got I gotta take issue with. Number one, dude's like 73 years old. His son's in his 50s or something like that. They they started some fires. They're not terrorist terrorists. There was nobody died and and nobody was injured and nobody was even in harm's way. They're fires. What's it called? Double indemnity when you try to try someone for the same crime twice? Uh, double jeopardy. Double um, jeopardy. Yeah, it, and um, that's not exactly the case because they were convicted. Um, what, what's go- they're, not, they're not being retried. They're being resentenced. Does this tie in at all to the Clive and Bundy story that happened down in Nevada? Because it seemed like it was a similar story. So Bundy's part of the 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 Ammon Bundy and, and all his knucklehead uh, family uh, are part of this story because they're the ones coming out. Because the the Hammonds um, reported to jail. <laughs> they they were like, we're going to jail because that's what we have to do. So the um it was it was the Bundys who came down and. They, they did the same thing. That big protest a couple years ago, maybe it was in just last year, where they had this big federal standoff. It all boils down to um, the, the federal government's, uh, what, what some believe is an overreach, an overstep of their power, because the, the state of Oregon cleared them on a lot of these things. 
Um, the federal government, for instance, said you have to build a fence to keep your cattle off of um, our federal land, and that would have cost a ton of money that they couldn't afford. Well, the the state <laughs> said, no, we're a fenceless state. You don't have to do that. In Oregon, they said, Oregon law, you don't have to have a fence, and, and it's okay if they wander onto our property. And then the federal government said, uh, essentially, you know, no, the state doesn't, doesn't matter what the state what says. What reason would the government have for the animals not to be fed and to graze on property that no one's really using anyway? So here's here's where you you, wa- you wander into a lot of conspiracy theory well, stuff. Well, part of this though just sim- sometimes isn't it just as simple as control. This is the federal government wanting to assert their power. They also want to get something done. Yes. This is the federal government saying this is our land. Don't yes. touch it. We've had enough. Here's the federal government saying, you know what? We really want you to move. So we're going to push you out. I mean, the, Mac's been involved in real estate. This kind of stuff happens in terms of property battles frequently between yeah. even privatized citizens and companies. Eminent and domain kind eminent, of stuff. Eminent domain kind of stuff. And, right. and, and that sort of thing. I'm not saying that it's good or it's good practice. Yeah. That's that's a whole different thing. But that kind of right. is what this sounds like. So the so it's not just the Hammond family that's up there now. It's did I say it right? Hammond. Yeah. Yep. The Hammond family, but it's also these Bundys. Yeah. Who have come up and other people who are angry and upset about this federal overreach of well, the Hammonds land. were surrounded. Their their ranch was surrounded by other private ranches. Okay. And they all were pressured and sold. They, they all, because they couldn't afford, um, the they, the federal government dropped their leases too. The Hammonds just stayed. They, they just toughed it out to the end. Um, so all of those families have the same sort of uh, issue. All right. So do you understand now? I'm caught up. You're caught up. So we can talk about the book of Revelation. I guess. <laughs> is, is it one revelation or two revelation? Uh, there is more than one chapter. We'll talk about it when we come back live. Oh, and a little update on Donald J. Trump. That's next, live. Duck and Donald. Credit cards are like grandkids. They love you. Sometimes get out of control, and it's fun to get a new one. Who can stop them from piling on? Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of Des Moines. At the end of the day, you can return the grandkids, but you're stuck paying off bad credit card debt. We'll help you put the fun back into using credit cards responsibly. Right, kids? Yeah! If you need help getting credit cards off your back, call Consumer Credit of Des Moines. Hi. My name is David Burrier, your Hope Coach. I host a live weekly talk show called I've Been There every Thursday afternoon at 5.30, right here on webcast1live.com and on my weekly radio program Saturday mornings at 10 on Truth Network 99.3 FM. I interview common everyday people who have survived incredible life challenges and who testify to God's faithfulness in the midst of their storms. So join me as we bring a message of hope and encouragement. Everybody needs hope. I know, as I've been there. Rockton Prevention is celebrating 25 years of creating a caring community. We want to say thank you to the tens of thousands of Rock High School mentors that have carried our message of health, love, and encouragement to over 1.5 million children, teachers, and parents. Our mentors teach children methods and skills to prevent bullying and drug use. Thank you to all the school administrators, teachers, and counselors for the opportunity to serve you. Rock on, fair citizens. Rock on. This is Pat McManus for Rock and Prevention, the Richard O. Jacobson Foundation, and this station. 
from the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios. This is Webcast One. 21 minutes after 4 o'clock, 421, 27th day of January, Lord's Year 2016. Five days from the Iowa caucuses. And I sure appreciate you letting us uh, have a, a day of prayer yesterday. It was a uh, rejuvenating moment for me. I hope it was for you. If you missed it, uh, I, I had a terrible show on Monday. I completely was unprofessional. I was angry at uh, my candidate, Donald Trump, for saying some of the things he said over the weekend. It made me feel stupid. Uh, basically, he said he could go shoot somebody, and I'd still vote for him. And, and that's just that. And it's not the fact he said he could shoot somebody. It's the fact that no matter what he does, a Trump fan will follow him. And you know, depending he, on who he shot, it might make me vote for him. I'm just saying. <laughs> I, I have to clarify something. I got a text right in the break that it, it did not sound like I said ducking Donald. It sounded like I said something else. I'm saying Donald Duck, as in ducking Donald. It's a hashtag right now on Twitter. Oh. So I wanted to clarify that so I did not violate I, I, that's the not what I heard, Chris. FCC regulations. I, I heard a definite violation. No, no. It's I clear. said ducking Donald, which is a hashtag. I don't it's think it's so. a thing that Ted Cruz is doing right now online, trying to draw attention to Ted wanting to one on one debate uh, Donald and, and sort of picking on Donald Trump yeah. for uh, skipping out on this debate. I had to clarify. I. I I feel embarrassed. It's on tape. Has so he positively worry. said he's not going to debate? Yeah. You know what, though? That's what he said, but... Well, and, the, and, and, and yeah. Yeah, well, he's not that gonna. guy. He's not you going to. Gonna? <laughs> you don't think he's going to debate? Show yeah. up to debate? <laughs> I'm interested in the ratings because he said gonna, there was 24 million... Ratings are going to be huge. Yeah. They're not going to be any different. Let me, let me just put it <laughs> into perspective for you. We have a man who wants to be president of the United States... Now, I admit that takes an incredible ego. It takes a, an incredible self-assurance. Uh, you, you've got to think a lot of yourself to take the hits that you do as president. And his money, his money's nice because now he's not bought and paid for during the campaign. But Donald J. Trump has said that he can go up against Putin. He can go up against Iran. He can go up against any world leader and stand for America and negotiate the best for us. But you can't go up against little Megyn Kelly. That was a nasty attack, though, by her. Well, here's I, think, I don't agree at all. <laughs> I, think, I don't agree at all. I think everybody's missing the point on this. I, and I, I told you my theory on this earlier. Um, I liken it to Google. Google does not sell products. They don't want to sell you Gmail. They don't want to sell you Google Calendar. They want you to use the Internet. They don't make money when you buy something because they don't sell stuff. Google makes money when you use stuff, when you Google. use the Internet, right? So... In, in my opinion, if you use their, their their well, no, they just want no, they they just want you. To, they know that the more you use the internet, the more chances there are that you're going to stumble on a site with oh, a okay. Google ad, okay, something okay. like that. Yeah. So they're just trying to get you online, get you online, get you online, and they make money. That's Donald Trump, but instead of getting online, it's talk about Donald Trump. Yes. He yes. doesn't want to be president. What he wants is people to talk about him because when people talk about him. He makes money. So what do you do? You, you, you say nasty things about women and, and people from Mexico. You say horribly racist things. You, you, tell, you do what you did to Mac. Mac made Donald Trump a pile of cash on Monday because what you said, you're all so upset. But he said he could shoot somebody in the street. You're talking about Donald Trump. I that's know. cash in his pocket, bro. I mean, that, that's all he wants to do. Well, So we keep he ducks the interview and... We talk about it, and he makes money. Well, I'm not so sure that Donald Trump doesn't pull a reality TV thing and walk on that stage at the last moment. Remember, he's got Secret Service. I know. He could probably walk on at any moment, and he would be a superstar. Now, I don't know if that'd make me change my vote and go back to caucus for him, but I don't know. Let's move on to the Book of Revelation. It is shenanigans, okay. though. Shenanigans. What? Well, I was just going to suggest maybe at the last second they'll dump Megyn Kelly and oh, uh, they'll, no. they'll no, they're not gonna. do the debate. No. That would be a bad, bad move on yeah. the part of Fox News. Fox they makes would. money when you watch Fox. That's right. And now everybody wants and to see what's the deal about this Megyn Kelly. And he's yeah, going yeah, yeah. to run a simultaneous event supposedly raising money for the uh, disabled veterans. Is he doing it in here in Iowa somewhere? I don't know. Well, the debates are at the Marriott, so that would be that would be really smart. I, when he announced what he was going to do instead, pff, I thought that was a slam dunk. He's going to go raise money for vets. I mean, I'm sorry, but he he's he's doing he's doing. 
look, I respect vets, but he's doing the same thing to the vets with this that he did with the evangelicals. If you are a vet, you are being played by Donald Trump. Be offended. Be mad. Be very Run away from Donald Trump. He doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about evangelicals. He only cares about Donald Trump. Trump. Ooh. Be offended. I want up you. He only cares about Donald Trump's money. Well, and, well, and yeah, well. I, I'm going to say something. If Tana Gertz is listening, she's probably never going to talk to me at church again. But um, Donald Trump is no different than Barack Obama. Barack Obama said he'll make law with his pen and his phone. Donald Trump says, I'll manipulate you and spend my own money to get the laws passed I want to pass. Yeah. So, Anyway, let's go to Luke Tim, pastor at... Uh, are you lead pastor still? Hasn't anybody bumped you off yet? No, <laughs> there's been many attempts, and uh, nobody's been successful. So thus far, I think still we just need to, Frank, I think you should become a <laughs> uh, Missouri Senate uh, pastor and go over there to Living Faith and show those cowboys what's going on. Okay. I was. I'm, I'm closest. I was baptized in ELCA Lutheran. That's. I'm close. That's like Lutheran light. Yeah, That's I'm good. on my Lutheran way. I can. Light. I can. I can grow up and be a Missouri Senate Lutheran when I grow up. Yeah, we put some big boy pants on. We'll let you come. I'm just teasing. I love. I, honestly, I want. I want to say that. I. I say that because of Mac. Really. Yeah, he's just giving me. Yeah. yeah. I, the ELCA is is a, a church blessed by the presence of God. Let's not. Let, for all of their faults, there's just as many blessings. So. Yeah. And absolutely. the Missouri Senate has the same. So um, let's talk about Revelation a little bit. Um, This book written by John on the island of Patmos is terrifying to a lot of people. And I think Mac kind of hits the nail on the head just because it seems so funky, right? I mean, it just seems so weird and hard to get your head around. Um, So before we talk about the actual text, I want to talk about how we read Scripture in terms of allegory and... um, when we're talking about comparisons and similarities, metaphors, right? Okay. Um, so th- there is this myth out there that it's so hard to read the Bible and understand when we're talking metaphor or when we're talking literal, right? It's so hard. Why do you take that part of the Bible literal? Why do you take that part metaphorically? And and, and those who are sort of opposed to Christianity will, will tout that as, a, oh, you pick and choose what you take metaphorical and what you take literal. Well, no. Um, it's just that metaphor is a simple way for humans to navigate the world, and we've been doing it for thousands of years, right? So if I was if I was talking to Mac uh, today, and I and I said, "Man, you know that I, I saw this guy at the gym. He was working out. He was lifting weights. Dude was hard as nails, man. He was just just jacked, yoked, right?" Do I think he's, his biceps are actually made of steel? <laughs> no. I, I think you would get the metaphor, right? Yes. You wouldn't walk around confused all day going, how on earth am I ever going to know what Luke meant when he said that guy was yoked? Like, did he actually have a yoke? No. He, he's a big dude because you understand metaphor. We all understand it. It's not nearly as complicated to understand as um, some who want to deny what Scripture talks about or or insert into our conversations about scripture, confusing things that, that seem to be, uh, in a sense, contradictory, even though they're not. Okay. So how do we understand that? Well, there's three ways to look at any part of literature, not just scripture. You can read it literally. You can read it figuratively. I hope you wrote those like separately because in the middle, <laughs> I'm sorry, I should have done that. You think way too linear. And that's what I'm going to try and do. I'm going to turn break Literary, you, literary. Literally. Figuratively. Figuratively. And in the middle is... Literalistically. Literal? Listically. Listerly. All right. Literalistically. Lit-er-ly. List-er-ly. Right. So in, 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 <laughs> in things like figurative speech, um, it is very, very clear that you're using hyperbole or you know using a metaphor. The kingdom of heaven is like a field. The kingdom of heaven is like this. That's a metaphor, right? Um, when Jesus says, you know, other things like this is, he means is. How do we know that? Because he's really good at making metaphors. He does it all the time. Like when he said, the kingdom of heaven is like. Metaphor is, is part of Jesus's daily life and, and walking around saying, you see this fig tree? So metaphor is, is, is found all over the scriptures. And it isn't confusing to you if you read it through the eye of, of understanding metaphor the same way today as we do back then. Now let's talk literalistically. Here's John. Here's what happened. John is an, an elderly guy, old dude. He's uh, on the island of Patmos. Uh, he's been exiled there by... Is it important, the name of the island? Is that significant for any reason, or it's just 
if, if, he's on if the you want to know where it is. Well, it's it's useful okay. too because right. we can go there. You can. <laughs> Yeah, if you want to send John a letter, smart Alec you need Bob. to know. The end. Meta- metaphorically, I want to tell you, you're a smart Alec. <laughs> yeah, well, literally, I agree. Um, so, yeah, so Pat Moses, it's just to know that we can go there. Like, Pat Moses is a place you can get a plane ticket, not to Pat Moses, but close enough, and, yeah. and get on a boat. So, um, he's chilling out, and, and he has this revelation. And if you read the, the book, he's sort of caught up into the spirit and he starts to see these things, writes it down, and, and sends this on to the seven churches. And we'll talk about that in just a second. When we read Revelation, it's not metaphor in the sense where he's saying, I figuratively or symbolically. Now, he experienced something that was real. And, and he experienced something by the Holy Spirit that I have not experienced. And he wrote it down by way of uh, like a, a spiritual inspiration, so it is the Word of God. So it's not, in a sense, figurative, right? But literally, there are numbers and there are details where you, you have to scratch your head and say, did he literally see 144,000? Or is that number symbolic of something? So this is where we employ that middle of the road where I said literalistically. So he literally did see a whole big pile of people, but that has a figurative sense to it that means something else. So if, if we look at the 144,000, let me see, I pulled that up before. Um, it is in Revelation 7. It says that uh, saw standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, and no wind might blow on the earth or sea or against any tree. Another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of God. All of these angels, and then he hears the number of those who are sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. So some have tried to find this literally and say, dude, only 144,000 go to heaven? If you understand it literalistically... I mean, that's the popu- That's the membership at Hope. <laughs> right. There'd be nobody else. <laughs> that's right. Just, just Hope would just go. Hope. <laughs> One church in Des Moines. If you're not in, you ain't in. Um, what is that number? Well, understand that the numbers have significance in, in the culture of Jesus at the time. So you've got 12 times 12. So the 12 tribes of the Old Testament, the 12 disciples of the New Testament, right? So what you have represented is all of those of the Old Covenant from Abraham and through Isaac, all of those of this New New Testament thing that are represented. That's why, if you ever wonder why Jesus chose 12 disciples, it's representative of the 12 tribes, right? This new thing that Jesus has done times 10. 10 is a perfect number. It, it is a, a godly number. Seven is a number that is a divine, you know, the creation in seven days. But now we got 10, right? So 10 is a fullness number, a complete, godly, complete number. Uh, in fact, the, the Bible, if it were to run on a system, it would totally run on, um, uh, on the... Oh, it's, Windows it's, 10. Not Windows 10. Oh. It'd totally be Mac. Um, <laughs> the, uh, what is the, the, the 10... Anyway, an operating system. The kilo, kilometers are part know. of the decimal. Uh, metric system? Metric system. Thank, thank you, finally. Oh, my brain was, was right. just tied up. We're going to take a first break. Okay. So, Dylan, I need to come back to that 40, 144 for just a minute when no, we get that, back. That, that's fine. It, but isn't that, isn't that the number that Jesus said how many times you need to forgive somebody? No. That, that was, was seven times seven. Seven times, okay. All right, Luke Tim is explaining uh, Revelation, and he's got to do it in the next 18 minutes because that's all we got. So we're coming back live here on The Truth. Yep, The Truth, 99.3. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. I'm Brian Leach, owner of Service Legends, and my position is Chief Talent Officer. I'm Nicholas Wondershide. I am Bernie Hobbs. And I'm the Service Manager. Marketing Director and Client Relations Manager. Everything that we do is about ensuring that we exceed your expectations. Our clients are important to us. 100% satisfaction. We're not just focused on heating and cooling. That's the easiest part of our job, actually, is fixing furnaces and air conditioners. Everyone that we come in touch with, we want to improve lives. Bottom line is, we've got our installation guarantees, 25% energy savings guarantee, comfort guarantee, temperature selection guarantee, property protection guarantee. 100% satisfaction guaranteed, fixed rate or it's free. All of those guarantees are backed up 
with a 100% money back guarantee to hold ourselves accountable to making sure that you get what you're after. Just fixing the problem today, if they have another problem five days down the road, it's still a fixed rate or it's free. We use what's called straightforward pricing. Our technicians are gonna give you an exact to the penny price on what it's gonna take before they move forward with any repair. That way you know what to expect. It's the same price every day. No surprises. If you get off work at five o'clock in the afternoon, you come home, you realize that, oh, my furnace is broken. Now you need to call somebody out that night. You shouldn't have to pay more for that. We're guaranteeing service 24-7. We run afternoons, evenings, nights, weekends. We're staffed to work that. Phone rings at 3 in the morning. You'll get one of our representatives answering the phone every time. We're not sending you out to Timbuktu and some call center. It's our service legend team members, our mission control team. I'll take a call anytime. And then they answer the phones the same way during the day as they do at night. It's a great day at your service company. How can we make Make you smile. That's the only way to provide true 24-hour service. When you're able to let somebody actually live in their home safely when they weren't able to do that before, where they don't have to stay up at night and worry about is the heat going to come back on? Are we going to freeze the pipes? Is the baby in the room next door going to be sick because they got too cold? When you're able to help somebody overcome challenges like that, that's impacting a life. That makes a difference. I get goosebumps thinking about it. I love the team. I love the people that I work with. <laughs> we have fun, but we work hard. I call them my ambassadors of legendary service. If you could just envision what that is, that's who we're sending to your home. They literally will call in, pick up the phone and call and say, hey, I want to talk to your manager. And I get on the phone, they're like, that technician that was at my house was the greatest technician ever. That's cool to me. We want to brighten people's days. Every person that we have going into the house has gone through an extensive background check. Drug testing, we have a very thorough interview process that one out of 140 people make it through. If we promise you something, that's what you're going to get, no matter what. We're here when you need us to protect the safety and comfort of your family. If you're not happy, we're going to make it right. If we're willing to put 100% money back guarantee on what we do, what type of work do you think we do? Give us a call. We're there for you 24-7, 365 days a year. Enough said. Twenty-two minutes, twenty-two minutes before the top of the hour, five o'clock. Ask Hank, uh, Hank the Bible Answer Man, one eight eight eight. Ask Hank. Uh, we are going to also have Luke back uh, next Friday, and uh, maybe the Friday after that. We don't know because we want to understand uh, this simple explanation of Revelation. Now you're going through the numbers, which was in the fourth chapter of Revelation, about 144,000. Yeah, and what, what we need to do is, and I don't want to belabor this point, but we got to just jump into understanding what what literalistic means so that we can, uh, so the rest of the book can open up to us, right? And so I'm just using chapter 7 as a, an understanding, a, a teachable chunk so we can jump from there. So 144,000, what does this mean? It's not that there's 144 that are sealed in heaven. What it means is that um, what John saw and what he's describing is a full, complete number. It is 12 times 12, so the 12 represented in the Old Testament plus the 12, or times the 12 of the disciples of the New Testament. In other words, you multiply mm -hmm. those two together and you get yeah. um, those of the Old Testament who lived in the promise and those who in the New Testament live in the fulfillment of the promise. Well, how many of those? So the ones of the uh, lived in the promise, the ones who are living um, in the fulfillment of the promise. How many of those? Well, if you take ten, and and you multiply that number that you had twelve times twelve, and you multiply it by ten, that is a a complete and full number. But then you multiply it by ten again, and then you multiply it by ten again. So now you have a trinitarian, fully complete multiplication of the total. The point is in chapter seven, what you hear is, who is it? that is sealed in heaven with the king and the creator of all um, the universe. You've got everybody, Old Testament, New Testament, lived in the promise and the fulfillment of the promise. All of them, every one of them, not one of them who lived in the promise or fulfillment of the promise has been lost. They're all there. So you see how there is mm. a sense of it that seems figurative, but it is still a literal thing because 144 is, is 144,000 is a specific number. That's how you read things literalistically. So we don't dismiss Revelation as a figurative work, like it's this literary thing that we have to figure out. But you also don't read it in a rigid um, and literal sense, because what you end up doing is um, trying to deconstruct and decode things. And you end up going, oh, this number is this, and this number is that. And then we got 100 years here, and then we got 1,000 years here. And what is this millennium, and this tribulation, and what is this dragon, and this dragon, and, and that woman, and this thing over here? 
and you get caught up in all of this stuff. And this is where most Christians spiral into this confusing thing where they shut the thing and go, yeah, never mind. That's me. That, that's <laughs> right. me. Right. I mean, I've studied a lot of books of the Bible, and I hope to study them all eventually. But Revelation is probably my last book. Right. Because I, you're right. I do. All right. Uh, Luke Tim from Living Faith is our guest. 244-0077. That's the uh, telephone number if you want to call in. We've also got the Service Legends Truth text line at 809-0993. Bob Monsoret is uh, checking that. Mm. And we've got a couple texts we want to talk about yeah first one i'm going to read is i think the topic of talking about revelation is a cover-up to get folks to listen to politics <laughs> i hope not well i am an apolitical human being i, yeah, I don't, don't care, like do any of them will you even caucus i am i got to, one of my church members knows that i have a favorite Okay. And is their favorite and they love them very much and said you got if you believe if you like them you got to go and I'm afraid to even tell you who it is. Well, you can tell me, or you don't have to. I don't care. I am going to caucus for Rand Paul. Okay, good. Because I'm bad at math. Well, I'm just glad you're. <laughs> I'm just glad you're going to caucus. All right, and another one. Another, another one. The next one is when will I be raptured? You will not be raptured because that is not a biblical principle. <laughs> it's, that is something it, people pull that out of Matthew chapter 24, uh, and we we can buzz over there in a little bit. But the rapture is something. It's a doctrine that was, um, I say, invented. You want to call it developed? It's not that old. It's it's like a hundred years old. Well, but if it was in Matthew, that means it's two thousand years old. Now let's go to Matthew. But that, no, well, I don't. Is there a difference? Is there a difference is though, there. Uh, Luke? Is there a difference between being raptured and the second coming? I th- is there a difference between those two things? Yeah, technically, yes. What, when people talk about the rapture, what they're saying is they're they're taking a, a viewpoint that was um, has not been espoused that long. In fact, I think. It has its antecedents in, in guys like Darby and, and the Schofield Bible, that kind of stuff. I think that's where it began. It's like 200 years ago, right? And what they're saying is that there is this initial rapture um, before Jesus returns to have the thousand-year reign on earth. I, and I'm, I'm, again, I'm not a, a pro in that. But it, where they're looking for, for content on the rapture is in, in Matthew where it says two will be in a field and, and one disappears, one goes away. And the... The reading of that that is, has always historically been for thousands of years. That means that it, there's two people in the field, and one of them croaks over and dies. I agree. Yeah, I mean that's well, and also <laughs> in the, in the context there, Jesus is talking about in the days of Noah, uh, and and also to think about it in the days of Noah, those that were uh, left behind were those that were in the ark. Yeah, those that were taken were those that were died in the judgment. And right. so w- when we when we apply that passage to the rapture, we've actually flipped that and right. got it exactly right. backwards where we right. take it as those who are left behind are those that God uh, is pleased with and those that are raptured are the one, or I'm sorry, those that are left behind are the ones God's judging and the ones that are raptured, uh, taken up are the ones God's saving. And in the days of Noah, that would have been exactly the opposite. So we're reading it exactly backwards right. when we apply that to uh, the rapture. Are the ones that are left behind that God will judge, will he judge those three? Through the eyes of Jesus, or will be will be will we be judged without Christ? Right, so we're we're see this is what or does the, it all not matter? We're off the rails. All right, let, never let me, mind. Yeah, it. yeah, that's okay. Never mind. Frank has a question. All right, I have a question. I agreed with a couple of points you made about uh, the that's standing at, standing at the mill and one's taken, one's left, etc. And that every eye will see. I think is probably your view too. Uh, my question is this: Do you have? Uh, there's four views of the Book of Revelation. There's the futurist view, the historist view, the idealist view, the preterist view. Uh, one is like a continuum, a linear view. One is more of a fragmented view. I think Chris Roloff holds the preterist view. I don't know what Mac holds, but but what's your view of the Book of Revelation? Well, the so our our theology doesn't fall into those categories really well. Um, th- those are those are the standard categories that uh, so the the world of theology tries to put other people in. I would m- mine would fit closest to the the preterist. Um, well, you also mentioned the historic view too, right? Is that a non? How, how would you differentiate? Preterism versus the preterist view versus the historic view. Reading Revelation um, as history and as a historical work versus significant for uh, our life today and for what is yet to come. Gotcha. So, so let, me, let me kind of then apply this literalistic reading. When you read Revelation, the entire book spins in a circle. 
So you the same numbers come up over and over again, and it's because in, in the Western mindset, we are very comfortable with a linear, you start here and you end here. We all learn this in like fifth grade English, right? You have an introduction, then you've got characters, then you have some kind of conflict, then you have a denouement moment, and then you have a conclusion, happily ever after. Like every Western story is written this way, right? In, in this culture, the Eastern culture, it it turns and it spins and it swirls. You end up covering the same thing six or seven times in the book of Revelation. It, it keeps rolling around over and over again. So you bump into these numbers again and again, and sometimes it's listed as uh, 1,200 days, and sometimes it's listed as three months, and sometimes it's listed at, or three years. Um, sometimes it's just listed in different ways. But what that's doing is, is spinning the same story around and around. This is a picture not only of history, but Revelation is also a picture of the present and the future. The entire book is about only two things, and this is it. Revelation is about the majesty and the ruling of Christ our Lord, his triumph and, and his current position as the, the chief number one numero uno of all things and the mission of the church. Those two things. Now, if you try and say, well, it's about the end of time, you're just barely chipping away at part of the mission of the church, right? The church's mission involves the end of time, but, but that's not it. Guys, there's, there's this woman who's in Revelation, you find this woman who's hidden away in the wilderness and all this kind of stuff. Um, that's not about the end of time. That's about right now. And that's, that's the story of the church that's always been. You have these two witnesses that are standing guard, right? And then the, the temple, the outer temple is all destroyed and the inner temple is protected and the two witnesses fall and everybody thinks they're dead and, and the secular world rejoices. And then they come back to life. And you go, well, that sounds weird. You know, that sounds like what's always happened in the church. The, the history of the church has been, is, and will be always the same story. Flourishes, grows, Looks like it's about to die, and then it changes. We're coming back. Luke Tim is here from Living Faith. We're talking Revelation. He'll also be back next Friday because this is just simply not a short conversation. We're coming back. Credit cards are like grandkids. They love you, sometimes get out of control, and it's fun to get a new one. Who can stop them from piling on? Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of Des Moines. At the end of the day, you can return the grandkids, but you're stuck paying off bad credit card debt. We'll help you put the fun back into using credit cards responsibly. Right, kids? Yeah! If you need help getting credit cards off your back, call Consumer Credit of Des Moines. Hi. My name is David Burrier, your Hope Coach. I host a live weekly talk show called I've Been There every Thursday afternoon at 5.30, right here on webcast1live.com and on my weekly radio program Saturday mornings at 10 on Truth Network 99.3 FM. I interview common everyday people who have survived incredible life challenges and who testify to God's faithfulness in the midst of their storms. So join me as we bring a message of hope and encouragement. Everybody needs hope. I know, because I've been there. Rockton Prevention is celebrating 25 years of creating a caring community. We want to say thank you to the tens of thousands of Rock High School mentors that have carried our message of health, love, and encouragement to over 1.5 million children, teachers, and parents. Our mentors teach children methods and skills to prevent bullying and drug use. Thank you to all the school administrators, teachers, and counselors for the opportunity to serve you. Rock on, fair citizens. Rock on. This is Pat McManus for Rock and Prevention, the Richard O. Jacobson Foundation, and this station. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One. All right, 10 minutes before the top of the hour. Um, I need to know who to caucus for now. I, I have had my mind made up for weeks and weeks, maybe a couple months, and I'm changing, and so... I'm glad to hear your suggestions. You can do it publicly on face, ma face mail. You can do it publicly on Facebook. You can email me. You can just whatever. Because I'm, I mean, I kind of put all my eggs in one basket, and now my basket blew up. So 
If anybody's got any ideas, I want to hear them. All right, 244-0077, Luke Tim talking about Revelation. Let's go to the phone where Stephen is standing by. Stephen, you're live in Max World. How you doing? Hey, Max. How you doing? Good, good. What you say? Hey, uh, first of all, um, it's good to talk to you again. Uh, I'll say that uh, you can caucus for Ted Cruz if you like, so I'll just throw that out there for one thing. But uh, my question was um, in regards to what you guys were talking about in regards to the views out there. You said that some of you have views that are preterist and what have you, and that's fine. But I thought a preterist view was something that, for the most part, things have already happened. Well, we know with Revelations that a lot of things haven't happened yet. I mean, in Matthews, some things haven't happened yet. Um, and that's definitely talking about the end times. Uh, I'll give an example, and there's several of them I can give you. But in regards to um, Revelation chapter 6, I believe it is, where it talks about the sixth seal, where there's going to be um, the, the mountains and all the earth. The, earth, the mountains and the islands are going to be moved out of this place. The rich men, the poor men are going to go to the rocks of the of the mountain of the of the of the mountains and they're going to call on the rocks to fall on them. I don't believe that's happened yet. And if I'm and what I like for the gentleman to explain if possible is if that is a, a preterist view, when and where did that happen in history for uh, our eyes to be able to uh, go back and look at that and study that. All right, before I let Stephen go off the line, do you understand the question? I uh, sure do, yep. All right, Stephen, thanks for listening. I appreciate you. Go ahead. All right, so um, the the question is is um, rooted in an understanding of um, the book of Revelation in a literal sense. That's why I wanted to start with that distinction between literal and, and literalistically. So when you, when you read these things in Scripture and you're trying to find an actual correlation between this mountain fell down, well, which mountain fell? Was it Mount Vesuvius? Is it Mount this? Is it Mount... That's not what the book is trying to do. What the book is trying to do is, is this revelation is painting a picture of these things that have happened and continue to happen and will happen all the way through until we see Christ face to face. So not only has it happened in not not one way, see it, that's the literal thing is which one event correlates with this one thing. What the, the view that the literalistic understanding and the reading of Revelation says is it's happened a million times over and it's happening today still and will always continue to happen. And and you with faith, you know, he who has faith, let him hear, let him see it. You're seeing these things all the time. It's it, Don't try and correlate it to a specific event or and then this thing happened and then that thing happened. Um, that, that's a reading of the scripture that it draws so tight that you end up chasing down these rabbit holes and, and finding yourself in weird contradictions and finding yourself doing what scripture warns against doing. Because scripture says that um, no one knows the time or the place and and um, when it comes, it'll come like a thief in the night. To, to stand in a place and um, to, to believe that you can read revelation in scriptures and know when Jesus is going to return. If you do that as, as a body of believers, you end up with a pretty great disappointment. Frank, so, you have a question. Question. Um, well, there's That's the always scary. There's the mark of the beast. That's there's, not a question. There's the new Jerusalem. That's not a question. If a question is coming, okay, we're going to be allowed to the tree of life. Is that ha- again? Not since the Garden of Eden. Has that happened any time in history in a preterist view that we will again have access to the tree of life? Well, the see again when you understand it in the the context of literalistically, yeah, I have access to the tree of life. It's mine right now. Yeah, I have all of the the riches of God's kingdom have been bestowed upon me because of Christ. I have those things. I have the the crown of life is is mine right now. Okay. <laughs> so getting back getting back to Revelation though, so. Um, and, and I guess one further way to, to, to answer uh, the question is, um, what I have, I have now, but as Paul describes it, dimly and not fully. What I will have one day when I see Christ face to face, the access to the tree will be, will be sharper, clearer, and more intensified. But let's, let's look um, at this. Here, here's the story of Revelation over and over again. When we hear Revelation, um, what, you, what I'm going to point readers to, um, I think I'm going to point them to, well, let's see here. Let's do Revelation 4. Um, yeah, that'll work. Or even better, let's do Revelation 11. That's even better. The two witnesses I was, I was referencing earlier. So when you, when you look at the two witnesses, I'm just going to paraphrase this. I encourage you to look it up on your own. 
this is the story. There is uh, John is told to take a staff and measure, and this this happens also in Ezekiel where uh, they measure the the uh, temple. It's a sign of protection. The inside of the, the temple is going to be protected. It is solid. It's not going anywhere, right? And then you have um, these other symbols that correlate to other things. I don't have time to get into all of that. We'll do that a couple of Fridays from now. <laughs> but then you have these two witnesses that stand outside. And um, what happens then in, in chapter 11 is um, they finish their testimony. The beast rises from the bottomless pit and makes war on them, conquers them, and kills them. Their dead bodies lie in the street of that great city. Um, and it's called Sodom and Eden, where their Lord was crucified for three and a half days. Uh, for some of the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in the tomb. They rejoice over the dead. And then there's a loud voice, and all of a sudden, the two witnesses come back to life. Kind of cool. All right. Here's the story. As small and as big, as, as minute, micro, and macro as you want to look at it, there is this, this thing of Christ's triumph. Though it looks like it's been defeated and killed and destroyed, and though people celebrate and rejoice for a short time... It turns out it comes back and is yet still alive. Apply that to Christ himself. There was a moment in time when it appeared as though all was lost and he was dead, right? Buried and in the tomb. People celebrated. He comes back to life and all of a sudden there's a new proclamation. Apply that to the church. The the church oftentimes starts to wane and and looks as though it's going to be dead and, and gone. And people celebrate in the streets. But then after a time, because of the power of Christ, it is lifted up and raised again. Three days, three years, three decades, whatever it might be, the story is Christ Jesus redeeming his church, keeping it safe, even though it looks dead, holding a remnant to raise it back up. So no matter what, however you read the scriptures in Revelation, read it through this lens. Christ is triumphant. He is first and foremost, and this is a story of our king, and we have a job to do. And even when it looks dark, and bleak and even when it looks as though the church has lost lose not faith because the Lord raises his witnesses back up to continue to proclaim the truth until he returns Amen All right, That'll preach as they say Yep, yep, that'll hold a dog all right, uh, or that dog will hunt. That That's dog what will I hunt. To say. I, you hold dogs. That's yeah. you're thinking about going home and holding your puppies. No, the puppies. dog holds the bird. <laughs> Please don't go hunting anyone and, in here except for me. No, no, that's right. And later we'll also get the recipe for bratwurst. No, not bratwurst. What, what is it? Braunschweiger. Braunschweiger. All right, uh, Luke will be back next Friday. We'll continue to talk about this. Your questions are always welcome until I see you again. You know what I'm going to ask? Forgive somebody that you've been holding a resentment against tonight. Seriously, dude, you've been holding it way too long. Because as you forgive, you shall be forgiven. I will see you in church.